Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining uh, today's NAC at Home program. My name is Chin Dow from the Architecture Committee at the National Arts Club. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can contact us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, please like and subscribe. On behalf of our architecture uh, committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Charting a New Course for Art Centers Across the World. Uh, following the conversation will be a Q&A, so feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. Um, we, you know, we could extend the Q&A period if there's more questions. Um, today's program, charting a new course for art centers across the world. Over the past two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged cultural organizations to grapple with serious questions. What is the relationship between the live arts and digital technology? How do we design art venues and cultural experiences for the future? How do these arts organizations embrace their civic responsibilities? How can art centers become hubs for reconciliation where communities can come together to celebrate cultural identities? So this is great. Normally the architectural programs would be um, a finished item, but more and more we're talking about how do we um, design something initially. So this is, we're very, very happy to, to host this pro program and, and to talk about these things. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Sarian, who will introduce himself and the panelists. Thank you, Chen. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for having us. My name is Alex Sarian. I'm the president and CEO of Arts Commons, uh, the largest performing arts center in Western Canada. After living in New York for almost 20 years uh, and in Argentina for 15, uh, I am joining you today from my new, relatively new hometown of Calgary, which sits on the land that is the original home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, the Stony Nakoda comprised of the Chiniki, Wesley, and Bears Paw First Nations, and the Sutina First Nation. This territory is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 uh, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Now, as a relative newcomer to Calgary, I share this information because it's important, at least for me and I think for us, to understand the longstanding history that has brought us to the land that we are on, regardless of where that is, and to understand our place within that history. While Calgarians acknowledge that this is a Treaty 7 territory, we don't always recognize that the First Nations of Treaty 7 understood this to be a peace treaty and not necessarily a surrender of the land. Uh, so with this knowledge, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize this unresolved history, to invite you to recognize perhaps the unresolved history of where you might be, and to thank these First Nations for sharing this land with us and to publicly commit to being good stewards of this land while we are here, and particularly as we talk about building on this land. In the spirit of gratitude, I also want to express my deepest appreciation to the partners who made today's presentations possible, the National Arts Club and the Council for Canadian American Relations, for inviting us to participate in their speaker series, Cross Border Currents, as well as the Embassy of Canada in Washington, D.C., and the Consulate General of Canada in New York. I'd also want to acknowledge that while we are while we will be discussing universal topics that are applicable to arts communities around the world, this conversation is grounded in the Arts Commons Transformation Project, a $450 million expansion and modernization campaign in the heart of downtown Calgary, which is the single largest cultural infrastructure project in recent Canadian history. With that in mind, I, I want to express my deepest appreciation to our uh, project partners and friends at the City of Calgary and the Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. Now to the heart of our discussion. Um, over the past two years, I don't need to tell everybody in this room, the pandemic has devastated uh, the world. It has devastated communities and families 
and has challenged every single sector to, uh, to rethink who they are and what our value proposition is. Uh, and the arts are no stranger to that. In fact, I think uh, from where I'm sitting, I think COVID has highlighted uh, some very serious questions, questions that have been around for a long time and we can't shy away from that. Questions around how to increase access to the arts questions around how to redefine the relevance of an arts institution within a city or within society, and questions around how to measure the impact of what we do so that we can advocate and lobby for ourselves in new ways. Now, these questions have always been here, um, but I think if what COVID has done in, in many, many ways, the pandemic has highlighted a lot of the inequalities and has given us an opportunity to lean into these questions and figure out a new future. Questions around what is the relationship between live arts and digital technologies? How do we design arts venues and cultural experiences? I don't know about you, but um, uh, I feel like I'm selling a healthy experience and not just a cultural experience. That has been a big shift for us. How do art centers become hubs of reconciliation where communities can come together and celebrate cultural identities regardless of where we're located? And how, and ultimately, how do we break down barriers for cultural participation, whether these be geographic barriers, financial barriers, or more importantly, perceived barriers? I say all this because Arts Commons is not unique in that we are grappling with these big questions. Everybody is around the world. What does make us unique, however, I hope, is that we are currently presented with the once in a lifetime or once in a generation opportunity to bring these questions into a design process that can help redefine what an art center looks like, what a theater looks like, what a community hub looks like, and ultimately help redefine what the value proposition of an arts organization can be within any given city. I am incredibly, incredibly privileged that I get to have these conversations on a weekly basis with some of the architects and designers you're going to meet today. And ultimately, today's session is about opening up that conversation to the world so that a lot of the things that we are grappling with doesn't just remain relevant and impactful for Calgary, but we want to invite all of you into, these, into this conversation and into these questions. Um, so I, I say all this because while we will be referencing this project, um, please know that ultimately the goal is for a lot of these questions to be asked within your communities, within your cities, within your organizations, and understanding that while the, while the answers may be very different depending on the community that you're in, we feel that some of the questions are worth um, uh, sharing widely. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today. I'll give a brief overview of who they are, and then I'll jump straight into questions. Uh, we are joined uh, by members of the Arts Commons Transformation Prime Design uh, team, which is being led by Marianne McKenna. Now, Marianne um, from KPMB was born in Montreal and educated at Swarthmore College and Yale University. Marianne is invested as an officer of the Order of Canada for creating, quote, architecture that enhances the public experience, end quote. The architecture of concert halls is one of Marianne's particular areas of focus, recognizing the power of the arts to both inspire and build community. This work includes the Royal Conservatory TELUS Center for Performance and Learning with its acclaimed Kerner Hall and the renewals of Orchestra Hall in Minneapolis and historic Massey Hall in Toronto. Marianne, welcome and thank you. Um, Wanda De La Costa, also a member of the Arts Commons Transformation Team, is a member of the Saddle Lake Cree Nation. Wanda was the first First Nations woman to become an architect in Canada. In uh, 2022, she was awarded an honorary fellow of the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada. She is the director and founder of the Indigenous Design Collaborative, a community-driven design program which bring, brings together tribal community members, industry, and in this particular case, a team of Arizona State University students and faculty to co-design solutions with tribal communities. Her firm, Tawa Architecture Collaborative, is based in Arizona and Alberta, and we are certainly uh, benefiting from that uh, incredible expertise. And last but certainly not, uh, not least um, is Josh Dax from Fisher Dax Associates, who is recognized as one of the world's leading theater consultants, drawing on his background as a violinist, trained as an architect and having practiced as a theatrical set and lighting designer. Josh has led FDA's consulting practice for over 30 years, providing planning, programming and design leadership for hundreds of successful projects. He's worked with many leading North American theater companies and has helped plan and design four opera houses, including the Marinsky II Opera House in St. Petersburg and Four Seasons Center Opera House in Toronto. 
chances are if you have had a life-changing arts and cultural experience, you have come into contact with the work of these three incredible panelists. So thank you uh, so much for joining us. And I will jump straight into the first question, which is uh, for Marianne. Um, Marianne, as you know, uh, the, the procurement process uh, for selecting the prime design team was incredibly competitive and, and somewhat extensive. We ultimately went uh, with this particular team because of the leadership experience and the unique approach that you presented that uh, made us heavily lean in your direction. Uh, in addition, it was the passion for this project that sealed the deal. But I'm curious, as somebody that was participating in that design or, or selection process from the other side of the table. I'm curious if you can share what that RFP process was like. And I've heard repeatedly that um, these projects are evolving, starting with the RFP process. Clients are starting to look for different things. And so I'm curious if you can share from your perspective, what has made this project unique as early as you thinking about the proposal uh, phase? Thanks, Alex. I think you've been incredibly articulate about the challenges that we, the, the, the challenging circumstances that we find ourselves in post after COVID or during the end, the wind down of COVID. Uh, but there were a number of things in the RFP process. And it was a project that I thought, um, are we really interested? And the elements that came out of the RFP, there were several. The first was really that idea of Indigenous, um, understanding what the Indigenous um, component was that that being able to speak to those issues and incorporating in our team somebody like Wanda from Tawau was was a kind of critically important of, of building a team even before you you actually submit the RFP. So ways of knowing um, I'm on the board of um, advisory board at McEwen University, which is based on Indigenous program. The architecture school there is based on Indigenous. Program programming at Laurentian University. And so I'd had some introduction, but but many of the RFPs are now asking us to, to understand what the issues are. And what I've learned through Wanda is it's it's our understanding, but our ability to, to have her speak to this issue. So I won't go any farther on, on this because I know she is the most articulate. Um, I would say uh, there, there are issues of stewardship. Um, that were very important, that were articulated within the RFP. Um, I think stewarding uh, a project like Arts Commons, I think the leadership made a huge difference. Like you really want to feel that the leader of this project, which resides at Alex, I must say, in you know, much of the leadership resides in your articulation of the issues um, and your ability to express the challenges, the barriers that that face uh, a broader and inclusive community because uh, including a larger community and a more vulnerable community has been was a very important part of it so listening to the broadcast that you as a leader made not really through the the rfp but actually your ability to be in many multiple places at multiple times during covid and talking about the barriers of location of how hard it is to rebuild to get people to come to a downtown if it's not an animated downtown how this project might be part of the downtown um the financial Financial barriers of, you know, do we always have to, does the, everything have to be ticketed? Is it all driven by revenue? And then also giving, you know, creating a kind of the ambition to create a kind of architecture that, that doesn't exclude people, that includes people, that people feel this is my place. And that's a, that's a really different kind of architecture than performing arts have been in the past. And I would say a third thing that, that you asked for, which I think a lot of RFPs are now based on providing your experience with projects that are five years old. We've been in practice for 35 years. So, I mean, you did ask for a project, a successful project that was 20 years old. And so we were able to dig back into our portfolio and the Goodman Theater in, in Chicago is 20 years old and it works still incredibly well so that you know that idea that you can that there is a, there are projects and that the same people are in this firm that did those projects is was an incredible ask and so i i'm really you know rail against this five-year criteria because i think it's it's ridiculous and perhaps the the kind of final comment would be or the the fourth thing was uh calgary itself the expression um in the RFP that this would be a project that would be for Calgarians. And so, you know, the idea that you can um, come, um, you know, we're in Toronto, but we're teamed with a local architect, with Hindle Architects, who are a fabulous addition to our team 
in addition to, to Wanda's firm, um, that we have a deep, that we can develop a deeper understanding of what the Calgary context is and see a city that's really in evolution at this time. You know, the ups and downs of the oil industry and the challenges that we have uh, across the country related to uh, fossil fuels. Um, I mean, this, this, you know, I don't know, we don't have the answers, but this project will find some of them, I think. And so that opportunity to address a community where the average age is, is 28, uh, you know, that's kind of extraordinary. So I get to wait away from my baby boom colleagues, the rest of Canada, and think about a younger community and what a younger community wants and how they may not have such established and ingrained ideas that we might be able to do something really different. So, you know, all of that is enough to, to raise the passion in any, in any uh, full-blooded uh, uh, architect. So it was, it was a great RFP. Thank you, Marianne. And, and one of the things that I think is so interesting, and we have friends from uh, the city of Calgary joining us today, and I think this is relevant to any major city in which you might be building or redesigning an art center, is that post-COVID, the role of downtown communities are going to be completely reimagined. And one of the things I'd like to give Calgary credit for, uh, and, the, and, the, and the city of Calgary and city council, uh, last year they passed a $200 million downtown revitalization package which that alone should have been a call out to the world for other cities to follow suit. But one of the things I find so exciting is that of the $200 million package to revitalize downtown, the single largest line item was cultural infrastructure. So not only is Calgary drawing a line in the sand saying we need to invest in the, in the future of our city and our downtown, the arts and culture is a huge part of what's going to bring that back. Um, now let's move away from infrastructure and I'll pose a question for Wanda. Um, Wanda, you know, some of what Mar Marianne was talking about, and certainly what we talk about all the time at Arts Commons, is about making sure that we are relevant to the communities that surround us. Um, and that can mean something completely different to anybody on this call, depending on where they are. Where they are. Um, but for Calgary, it's really tuning into the, to the Indigenous communities that surround us. And one of the things that um, I've heard repeatedly, and it's a, it's a sound bite that I love, is that the arts have become a luxury good that are overconsumed by too few people. And so as we rethink the future of downtowns, as we rethink the future of arts and culture, we also need to rethink who it is that we're doing it for and why, and this idea of nothing for us without us. So Wanda, my question for you is, you know, one of the requirements of this project um, that was critical was that the design team bring what we consider to be an intercultural perspective. Now that we're in the design phase, can you share with us how you're approaching that integration of indigenous experience and knowledge into what um, is a very exciting design and architectural uh, phase? Sure, sure. So we've already started conversations with the Calgary Indigenous community. As you know, I lived there for over a decade, and so I still have a lot of relationships, uh, deep relationships in that in that city. Um, but we have artists, we have theater makers, we have elders, youth, and representatives from all of the major communities around in and around Calgary, including the Métis, the Inuit, and a number of local First Nations, which of course always includes the territorial hosts, the Blackfoot community. And we've started the conversations already. And as you know, also, our work is really about uplifting culture. You know, we've learned over the last, I don't know, 25 or so years that we've been in this space, working almost predominantly with our communities, that they hold, our Indigenous communities hold philosophies, philosophies that are not only inclusive, you know, designed to bring people together, but the belief systems honor this beautiful long-term seven generations worldview which focuses on the health and well-being of all living species now and into the future. And I think that sort of long-term collective thinking provides a really beautiful foundation for the ACT project. You know, a future, this future creative hub for Calgary, which is ultimately about bringing people together, getting people out of our, uh, you know, this, the stasis that we're in for the last two years and rebuilding those connections. But I think what it enlarges is that it expands um, what connections are out there, sometimes making visible what has previously been invisible in our cities, you know, where 60% of Indigenous people now live. I think what it also brings, this sort of philosophies, is this sort of awareness of place, the land, you know, things like solstice and equinox, the big sky, as we call it, back in, in, uh, in my home in Alberta. So we're really excited about, you know, bringing that way of thinking to a 
project as large and as impactful as this the ACT project will be. Um, at this stage now, we're just gearing up for our second large engagement. We usually do sort of a, a few um, large engagements and then do a number of deep dives to really understand some of the concepts that come out. So we start that process next week to see how we can bring more elements of indigeneity and Indigenous identity into the 21st century for this wonderful project in downtown Calgary. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Wanda. And then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pose a question um, after we hear from Josh about how do we merge the, the work that you're doing in consultation with these incredibly important stakeholders and ultimately have it impact what the experience of the building, you know, is. Um, so it's not just about uh, it's not just about engagement, but it's about taking that engagement and actually have it manifest so that, you know, five years from now when this building is complete, uh, they have a very different relationship to the downtown uh, community. Um, so thank you. Uh, and now over uh, to Josh. Josh, the question, the million dollar question. Um, seemingly artists um, are pushing hard at blurring the lines between art forms and genres. I think, you know, some, some might say the gone are the days where um, a hall can only be acoustic or a hall can only be for dance. And I think that we see it every day that artists and audiences are calling for more flexible and adaptable spaces in which to create and present their artistry. Now, for somebody like me, that might be an incredibly exciting and challenging uh, proposition. But as somebody who designs theaters for a living and that, and that experience, what is that call for flexibility and blurring the lines? How has it impacted uh, your work and what you think the future of uh, cultural spaces look lo looks like? Well, uh, uh, you know, artists have always led the development of theater space. Uh, if, if, and artists have always been serving a purpose, which is now, I think, resurgent, and you and Wanda have spoken about it, in terms of building community and and um, helping communities speak to themselves about themselves, uh, you know that's sort of underlies the artistic motivation. Uh, artists have always embraced change. They've always embraced technologies. And, you know, when the proscenium theater in 1603 used the highest tech stuff that was available, which was winches and ropes and ship rigging, right? Um, and now. Uh, there's electronics and there's there's video projection and there's VR and AR and people are trying to work with that. But I think that the most meaningful um, uh, kinds of change that are driving our spaces are the desire to um, no longer uh, be so rigorous in, in in the way that you define things. I mean, as you said, when back in the '80s, if you were building a performing arts center. Uh, the purpose was to make sure that you had enough seats to make a big profit when Phantom of the Opera came to your theater. Um, and everything else was what was lovingly referred to as the SOBs, Symphony, Opera, and Ballet, right? Um, so your local companies, your local SOBs would fill in the rest of the dates. And that's how people thought about things. And now, uh, thankfully, um, there's this new sense of purpose about bringing the community in and not saying what are we going to do to them or for them but what are what are they what do they need what are the local artists wanting to create um, and the whole trajectory um, of uh, certainly the 20th century and in recent decades has been away from things that tell artists how to use them uh, as a proscenium theater perhaps or if even a thrust theater might do and towards the idea of spaces that can be shaped and formed anew with each kind of performance. I and mean, this is something that was being done, uh, you know, by Jersey Grotowski in the 60s. And, you know, uh, people, people have been, been doing this a long time, but projects like Sleep No More, which is still running in New York, um, that just took an old warehouse and created an event that, that has lasted for a very long time now. Um, uh, calls for uh, artists to be able to reshape the space. And this is happening at all kinds of scales. The Park Avenue Armory in New York is one of several venues around the world. I was on a call this morning about a new project that we're gonna be doing there, um, where artists walk into this vast room that's 200 feet wide and 300 feet long and 65 foot 
tall with, with sort of railroad station arches and it's magnificent. Um, and artists want to do all kinds of things in there, whether it's dance or paintings with live dancers or uh, you know music or the New York Philharmonic, all kinds of things happen there a different way every time. That thread of thinking has led to a kind of new building type, which is art for art on an industrial scale. Um, the shed in New York City is an example of that. Um, and uh, at smaller scales, you know, we have a very long tradition of studio theaters that can be reconfigured in a variety of ways. So uh, these ideas, when matched with the desire to integrate the community more into the work that's being created um, and what the space is being used for, really does lead us in the direction of spaces that can be used for a wide range of things. And, uh, you know, there used to be the term lowbrow and highbrow. And thankfully, we're not talking about brows anymore. We're, you know, there's there's just there's good stuff, and it, it takes many many forms. So we're making rooms around the country, around the world, that on one night might accommodate, uh, you know, a, a standing audience drinking beer, listening to rock and roll, and on another night might be contemporary dance, you know, looking more traditional. Um, so those come out of the, the, the various needs that organizations like yours are trying to fill um, and the mission that it's trying to achieve. Great, thank you. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose a question for all three of you and we can, we can start a more sort of back and forth conversation. But you know, I, from all three of you, it's almost like these trends that we are now seeing didn't just pop up during COVID. It's almost like they were bubbling under the surface for a very long time. And if anything, COVID has accelerated a lot of these conversations. Um, uh, in a second, I'll be asking each one of you, what is a trend that you have seen accelerate perhaps at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an unusual pace um, over the past two years specifically? Um, uh, you know, for me, just, you know, the, and I mentioned this earlier, the idea that we're not just selling a cultural experience anymore, we're, 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 we're inviting people into, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm selling the health of the building. I'm selling, you know, I joke with our audiences that, um, you know, I never thought that I'd be standing on a stage and talking about the fact that we have MERV 15 air filters in our building and that that would actually be um, uh, increasing consumer confidence in, in people's ability to come back to the theater. That sitting in an arts commons uh, theater actually is the same um, air filtration experience as sitting in the waiting room of, of, of a hospital ER. Um, and I'd much rather people be coming to the theater than sitting in the hospital. I never thought that I'd have to say these things out loud, but now the audiences are wanting that comfort. And so I'm curious, uh, and I'll throw the question to the three of you, what is one trend that you have seen accelerate, perhaps at an, at an unusual pace over the past two years, that maybe is here to stay? And I'm open, anybody that like, would like to jump in first? Marianne. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, when you say some things have been around for a long time, but they have become new in a sense. Um, if you think of the spaces that we're creating, the theater, the black box, the rehearsal room, basically those are generally closed rooms, but they exist in a kind of context of interstitial spaces. And I think, um, you know, really provoked by a comment that Wanda made about what, how, how to welcome people. And I think these are the spaces that have this, this sort of response to where we're at is people want to come into a welcoming environment. Um, as we migrate from, you know, complete ice, various levels of isolation and back to the theater, I think you're there for community. And so how these spaces, the interstitial spaces, project to the exterior, that it's not just an empty lobby. And so the trend that I'm seeing is that there's that kind of convergence of spaces. Can a, can the cafe be the bar? Can, um, can the box office shrink so that we have more room for people to kind of gather? Can they be, can the, the public spaces or the spaces around these theater components, the, the performance components, can they be warm and welcoming and broadcast that life to the, to the to, in our context, to Olympic Plaza, to the streets around them? And so I think this is a kind of critical, and it's, you know, it's been in the work that I've done because I feel like performing arts are really about bringing community together. It's about outreach to community and that music and theater, they transcend theater, the ability to kind of see things 
things in a different way to to actually be the zeitgeist for our time. You know, but it, it, you got to get people into the house, and they have to be felt comfortable that they can that they're welcomed. And this is you know, Wanda sets the bar very high for this, and that there's that they want to perform in there because uh, it's it's more than just. Uh, you know, as Josh, it's more than people coming from outboard. It's more than the established institutions. It's these are community facilities where the, the city of Calgary is sponsoring this arts infrastructure. It's got to be deeper, broader, and it's got to be magnetic. You know, so architecture has a big role to play in this. Um, yeah, so that that's a trend I think that I, I never went away in my mind, but it's accelerated even now. Openness. But Marianne, there's something interesting about the fact that we're we're no longer designing uh, art spaces for ticket buyers, right? I think it used to be the case that we were designing an experience around somebody that had bought a ticket to something maybe weeks or months in advance. And now, you know, the conversations and, you know, I know that we have over, you know, 120 people joining us, but, you know, what, what are the adjacent public areas? You know, in Calgary, we have uh, Stephen Avenue, which is an incredible, um, uh, uh, pedestrian uh, laneway. We have Olympic Plaza. So all these conversations about how do we design something so that it's not just about people that are driving in or taking public transportation in, but you know, people that are walking by, how do they feel attracted to this and what can we do? Um, uh, what does a cultural experience look like for somebody that hasn't purchased a ticket? That to me is a really big question. And there are wonderful precedents in Europe um, where, in fact, the, the transaction happens at the door to the theater. And that would be the best is that you felt, felt welcome to walk through the, you know, the lo lobbies even seems like the wrong word, but to walk through the, the, the spaces, the interstitial spaces, and feel as though you could make a transition from, say, Stephen Avenue into a lower level of Olympic Plaza, that education programs are happening down at that level and spilling out so that there's reason you have an excuse to be there. And sometimes, you know, an espresso is a good excuse to go into the Royal Conservatory. They make very good espresso. So we attract University of Toronto, um, people off Bloor Street, and the, and the population, the professional and non-professional population that love music. So those, just that, those couple of things that actually speak to what the culture of Calgary is, are really kind of critical to find. So we're in an investigative process, uh, project, a uh, moment in the project, looking for that. Thank you. Now, Josh and Wanda, I know that, uh, what are your uh, takes on that question about trends? Well, you know, it's it, what's interesting, I think, about this this moment, which accidentally aligns with COVID, is is that, uh, you know, even before COVID, uh, there was the Me Too movement, and, and social justice was really coming to the fore, and anti-racism was becoming uh, the focus of so, so much activity. And, and um, its impacts, uh, the impact of, of people thinking seriously about that um, is reshaping, you know, everything right down to labor work rules uh, for actors um, and the ways that theater companies are approaching scheduling and, you know, uh, ju just, you know, what, what's an acceptable, it's really thinking seriously about the quality of life of uh, their their employees as well as their audience, um, in, instead you know of being solely directed to what what's put on stage, regardless of who gets sacrificed along the way, um, and and thinking more seriously about uh, the healthfulness of the enterprise, and 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 that has been true in every kind of performing arts uh, organization, including uh, uh, presenters uh, and. Um, and that is impacting the way we think about our buildings as well um, in, in a fundamental way, uh, particularly the recognition. It, it, we, we always recognize that there were a lot of kinds of artists interested in, in doing different kinds of work. Some were doing very avant-garde work. Some were really fantastically uh, you know, executing classical music or classical ballet or something from many, you know, from centuries ago. Um, but uh, so that diversity was always clear, but the diversity of cultures, um, the diversity of languages, the diversity of, 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 of performance typologies, and the diversity of spaces that are needed to accommodate those performance typologies um, is, is, is beginning to, to, to percolate in in a profound way. And that's, that certainly affected the, the, our thinking about the, 
additional spaces that we're making at Arts Commons because we're renovating some and we're expanding also, um, which is a great opportunity. And uh, uh, you know, I think that that's the big shift. It's a mental shift. Um, it's not about VR. You know, it's it's really about uh, how are we trying to connect with each other and for and to what end. And and Wanda, before I open up the question to you, one of the responses I, you know, our, you know, I, I know that we don't want to make this about Arts Commons, but there's so many takeaways and so many things that are transferable. You know, Arts Commons is a performing arts center that is home to six resident companies, many of whom are here today joining us, uh, over 200 community groups. So we, I mean, when we're firing on all cylinders, we have the ability to host 2,000 events per year, regardless of who's programming or who's responsible for it. When we have that level of inventory, there's no reason why we can't be strategic and have more things for more people. And there's one phrase that came out of uh, a study by Laplaca Cohen called uh, uh, Culture Track. There's a phrase called cultural promiscuity. This idea that audiences may not want to be subscribers to any one particular organization. They want to consume what they want to consume when they want to consume it, consume it on their terms. And to have buildings like ours and organizations like ours that don't just from a philosophical standpoint, but also from a design standpoint, recognize that people have different entry points into the arts and that once you're in the building for whatever reason, if you like this show at the Calgary Phil, you might love this show over at Theatre Calgary and that it's this one-stop destination and, and being able to create that energy and that community where your entry point might be unique to you, but you've entered a world of, of arts and culture in downtown Calgary that uh, is hard to escape now for better or for worse. So, um, so thank you. Now, Wanda, over to you for, for that question. Yeah, I'm thinking in terms of accelerated trends, you know, there's a number of things that come to mind, but I think for me, the, the sort of newness that Indigenous design presents um, for all projects is this sort of holistic reading. You know, it's no, I used to always, you know, um, um, react against architecture's focus on just aesthetics and just economics, right? What else is there? There has to be more, you know, spaces are for people, not for, you know, objects. And so I think there's this beautiful concept of relationality or interrelatedness that comes and within that circle now comes the social, the spiritual, the collective, the cultural and the economic and the aesthetic, but there's a broader set of metrics that we're looking at, which I think is really, really powerful. And within that system of metrics that, in, you know, that I think comes from, well, many, many new thinking, I think this isn't um, uh, reserved for Indigenous design thinking, I think there's many people thinking in this realm now, but there's a very um, hyper-local or place-based focus you know, we've all become more aware of where we are with the inability to travel and kind of relying on the local systems within our world that you realize that a lot of what you have, what you need is in a very short proximity around you. And how do we accentuate and really drive home this place? What is Calgary? What is, you know, performing arts mean to Calgary? What does art mean to Calgary? How do we include all those voices in that holistic sort of viewpoint that we're in today? And, and, and Wanda, let me, let me take that a step further. Maybe this is a conversation that you and Marianne can answer together, but how do we take these conversations, which in many ways are not new, but they might be new to the architectural and design process. How do we take all these conversations and philosophies and values and actually have them manifest into a physical experience, right? So like ultimately we know that we have done our job right. If by the end of this, of our time together on, on Arts Commons, we have a performing arts center that's never been seen before, where, where you know, somebody, you know, uh, um, an, an indigenous person living in downtown Calgary walks up to it and says, oh, this is, this was built for me. I can see myself reflected. What is, what does success look like for yeah. us? That's a great question. And I often, you know, as you know, I teach um, this subject at a university and I often share with my students that it's about three things. It's about incorporation of the worldview, which, you know, this is leading with indigenous ways of knowing. So that's very, very um, a powerful concept. But it sits beside um, identity and representation. What is indigenous culture? What is it in the 21st century? You know, there's no culture that has undergone so much change uh, as Marianne and I have discussed um, recently. And what is, what is, what is, who are we right now in this time? And I think capturing that identity or that representation for all of those 
um, communities within Calgary and around Cal Calgary is really important. And then the third thing would be the use or the program or the function of these spaces. How can we change the functionality of these spaces to be more inclusive? You know, maybe you don't buy a ticket, but what else is there for you in that art center? So I think it's worldview, representation or identity, and then function or, or use that I think are really critical, the three of those together. Marianne, let me open that question to you. What is it, how, how are these conversations changing your work and KPMB's work? Well, I think <clears throat> there's so much extravagant building um, that's go that has gone on in the, in the past decade, decades. Um, you know, some might say, might say a performing arts center is that another extravagant building? And how how do we? Uh, and I would say I'm a kind of you know minimalist in terms of the kinds of space that you need if you use them intensively. Like utilization is such an important part of this, and I think it will be part of the welcoming as well. If there's you know, you have your past is in educational programming around Lincoln Center, like that component of this is so deeply important. And you, you need an excuse to go into a building, uh, you know, I used espresso, but also because your kids downstairs doing um, a, a, a cleaner, dirty program, a dirty program downstairs, and you need to, you know, be there to, 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 to rinse them off or whatever is required to take them out of there. So I think it's the, it's the adaptability of spaces and the um, the utilization, the the dual purposing of things, and and to just be a little less hung up about you know, well the lighting may not be perfect or the audio, you know, get closer if we don't hear each other. You know, being adapt, using, getting, making spaces that are adaptable, and that that will create a kind of energy within the building. And I see it in some of the projects where we've done where we've done this, where we have uh, in somebody from in the audience is from Minneapolis, but we created a great long granite bench of the whole length of 11th Street where we took out the um, the car drop off because you know they have hybrid they have the um, the ramps the parking ramps, and and I've seen that long bench used for a school group where they may have 400 kids come in on so many buses you wouldn't believe it, but the kids just spray their coats along the length of this of this bench and so if you're walking down 11th street and you see you know 400 kids coats on the bench i mean that's a really that you know that this place is in action and i think that's you know if, if we can a, a lot of that comes out of the programming and i think the intensity of the programming so uh, understanding how we can make this, uh, you know, that kind of uh, place. I, I mean, I use the Royal Danish Theatre because it's got that wonderful, I know it has a different name, but it is on the canal with the great wooden decks and a restaurant that's there. And if you're just walking around in the evening, it's a great destination to go get a glass of wine at the bar. You're not going to, you're not going to the theatre. Or you may be, and those you've made a reservation for dinner in which case. But to have the mixing of groups, you know, to, to make sure that we make it accessible, that ex openness, the accessibility, uh, the adaptability of spaces, and that kind of generating the kind of energy that you expect to go to that you expect in a downtown. I think growing up in Montreal, that was what you expected. You know, that's it was never dull down in downtown Montreal. I haven't been there, I haven't lived there for a few decades, but it was that you you made great long walks to a city center because it was that kind of space. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. That would be success. And people hang out there for the afternoon. Uh, they're inside, they're outside the park. We have such a great site, you know, to, to use, to utilize. Josh, you have, you go for it. Yeah, you. Uh, 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 Marianne just reminded me of this. That, uh, we're doing a project which is uh, planning the renovation of Frank Lloyd Wright's Kalita Humphreys Theater in Dallas. And we've seen some letters back and forth between the artistic director and Wright, um, where the artistic director was pleading, pleading for a bar, a, you know, concession stand in the lobby and, and Wright, vehemently was opposed to this. He said it would be like putting a hot dog stand in front of the steps of the temple. You know, so he, he was, you know, art is sacred and, and the, you know, and food is not, and, and, and you should not mix the two. And, you know, on the other hand, Brecht, Bertolt Brecht said, you know, theater without beer is just a museum. Right. So he would have loved a hot dog stand in the lobby. Um, and I think we've all embraced the hot dog stand in the lobby now. <laughs> I think that's that's where we're headed. But I think we've also embraced and, you know, and I want to open it up to, to questions from from uh, folks who have joined us. 
but it, you know, this, it's not just about a hot dog stand. It's about redefining what excellence means. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, and, you know, during my time at Lincoln Center, we talked about this all the time. When people prioritize what they call artistic excellence, the first question that I ask becomes, well, excellence according to who? Because different cultures and different communities have different ways of expressing uh, um, culturally. And so this idea that let's move away from artistic excellence as a guiding, and and I might be I might be you know stoned to death for saying for saying that in this in this particular uh, setting, but let's what would happen if we moved away from artistic excellence as a guiding principle? Obviously, we still want cultural experiences within our facilities to be the highest qualities that anybody will ever experience. But what happens if we move away from this idea of artistic excellence as a guiding principle, and rather say and rather say we will measure the success of our building by the energy that people bring to it? Um, you know, can we stop asking the question, you know, what is what is the performing arts center's impact on the city that surrounds it? And instead start asking the question, what is the impact of the city that surrounds a performing arts center on the art center itself? So that there's this two way dialogue. And, and I, I think all three of you have hit on this uh, during your remarks. It's let's stop pretending that we are God's gift to the city that we know what's best. And let's, in fact, be this. Um, uh, this avenue or this channel or this, you know, uh, this place that that Calgary or New York or Dallas or wherever it is that any of us are, that we are a place where citizens, uh, all citizens can actually change the course and the narrative uh, of, a, of, of a city's uh, arts and cultural um, uh, identity. So um, I, I know that we, the four of us could talk all day and we do in fact, and I'm looking forward to our next meeting, um, but I do wanna open it up and, and Chen, I'll pass it over back to you. But in, in addition to the gratitude I expressed earlier uh, to all of the folks that are making this work possible here in Calgary and across Canada, I also wanna uh, uh, express a special thanks to members of the prime design team that are not here. We have Hindle Architects, which is a local uh, Calgary-based firm. And we also have SLA out of Denmark, which are two very important components of the design team. Hindle, of course, bringing that um, uh, Calgary uh, know-how. This is not a building that can just be plopped down in any city. It needs to be of and for Calgary while challenging what the future of Calgary looks like. Um, and SLA, of course, being one of the leading landscape and urban architects in the world, understanding what the integration of this building looks like with nature, which of course dovetails, be dovetails beautifully into conversations around um, our, uh, our indigenous commitments to not just uh, the place, but also the philosophy of our of our building. So with that, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank Marianne, Wanda, and Josh for joining me today. Um, and Chen, uh, over to you. Hi, okay, thank you very much. And I wanna thank you again for um, hosting this and for your membership. So we have some great questions. Uh, the first one is, do you see any opportunity to open art spaces for people to congregate during hours performances are not scheduled? Are there ways to welcome new audience members into spaces in low pressure, no cost ways? And I guess that might be for the architect or designers or maybe even um, you, Alex. Well, I can I can start philosophically and then I'll hand it over. So like from an art center perspective, from my position, if I think of uh, if I think of a performing art center as an asset. Right. So let, let, let's let's you know, let's talk about this in, in the most, um, uh, you know, monetized way possible. This is an asset that we need to monetize, that people need to come to. If this were an airline. If I ran an airline and I had an airplane that sat in on, you know, that sat empty for eight hours, 12 hours a day, that is not a best use of an airplane. So the question for us becomes, how can we take what we know makes a good performing arts center, which historically has only ever had to operate four or five hours a day? How do we take the idea of a museum that has a very different business model, um, try to bring those together so that we can be uh, so that we can operate and have a, a, a busier day or a busier week. So that's just programmatically. The other side of that financially, and everybody's spoken about this, is we need to be a destination for people that haven't bought bought a ticket. Um, you know, we have downtown Calgary is an amazing place. We're across the hall, we're across the street from City Hall, 
We're across the hall. Uh, we're across. Sorry, I can't even speak anymore. We have the Glenbow Museum across the street from us. You know, as as Calgary comes back post COVID, downtown will be a destination because there are all these different initiatives that are trying to get people downtown. If we were to build something that is a wall that says if you're only allowed in once you if you bought a ticket, that would be irresponsible of us. And I think every you know Marianne's comment about the coffee and education and making sure that people have access. And that public space isn't just a means to an end. It's not a lobby that gets you from outside to the to your seat. Um, that's incredibly important to us. Now, I you know I turn it over to the uh, smarter uh, smarter folks on this panel who can actually talk about how do you take that philosophy and actually make it reality. I think I think it's a different story in each of the kinds of spaces. Um, you know, the lobby is certainly one that um, we can and have planned to open up uh, at all times of day. The, the the venues themselves, the larger they are, the more challenging that can be. Um, but, you know, recent past has seen projects like the Skarmahorn Center that we did in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where we took a, a very traditional concert hall or otherwise traditional and taken the main floor of seats. And in about 40 minutes, they can be put into storage, leaving a completely flat floor that can be used for luncheons, it can be used for dancing, it can be used for, uh, you know, uh, banquets of, of all sorts of, of, of things. So that during the course of the day, there might be a rehearsal on stage in the morning, there might be uh, uh, some other kind of flat floor utilization during the afternoon, and then it might be back to a concert in the evening, um, which puts the venue into productive use. And we've, in the, in the new venue that we're creating, we're anticipating flexibility of that order of magnitude. We've, we've also talked about, I mean, it's, it's been a great um, exploration because the flat floor to, to raked venue is, um, you know, means that in a flat floor situation, can the doors be open? Can, can, can more than just a door be open? Can a wall be open? So that this space is an invitation to come in. You know, the amount of, you know, when I talked about the, the theater is a kind of closed room, but how can we break down that aspect and make it feel more like an open room, open to the lobbies? And we're, you know, we were constrained for space as, as always, it makes sense that you are because you get more done in a constrained space maybe than if you had unlimited space. So we're looking for that multiplicity of uses that I talked about before for complementary programs that should come in. I think the partnerships are really important. Um, the partnerships of the resident companies and the partnerships with other community groups that would come in and say, oh, oh if, you know, from one to three on Thursdays, I'd love to use that room in the flat floor configuration. We've also talked about things like having the flat floor be um, uh, at the same elevation as the stage, which I think is a really, you know, we're not, we're not done yet, but I think that's an incredible kind of an idea because you room, you move from one room, which is the theater room, the kind of into another room, which is almost cathedral like because it has a fly tower. How do you use those rooms? So I think we, we're kind of breaking down some paradigms here that we, we need to figure out uh, together where we're at the very beginning, you know, conceptually how we use them and integrate the activities of what, what do people want to do? So Wanda has a great program of, of talking to the indigenous community that, and bringing back information. I think the the importance of getting pe the population, the people of Calgary, to respond to say what they would like to do, and reaching out to them in terms of who who is who are natural partners and how might they use, you know, in the odd hours, so that there's always something going on. Toronto City Hall Square. Um, is an example. It's programmed. I mean, people say, oh, that's incredibly lively. It's programmed like 300 days a year, 350 days a year. That's what makes it so great is that it, you know, the focus is on it. And I think that, so it's, it's sort of linking hands on these things between a community like the Indigenous community and and the 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 the, the the owners of the, the you know, the city um, kind of joining hands on this. And the more um, the more we talk now, the better it will be. It's not going to, we're not just going to throw this great, great gift at you in, I can't remember the timeline, but in three years, we'll just open this gift and there you go, you got it. I think this is the important where people anticipate this is going to be for me. One, one of the things that Wanda showed us I thought was really great was, you know, which we don't think about, but she showed us, you know, she, as she as she said, some of the things that, you know, when you go to a museum in, in um 
I don't know, Abu Dhabi or something, and you see welcome, you feel like, oh, that's, they, they mean me in English. There's, everything else is in a different language. But, and so Wanda said, just by putting Cree language up on the wall, you actually change the feeling. And I, at first I thought, really? And then I thought about, yes, actually, the very small things make gestures of welcome, you know, an open door, a transparency into a space, uh, the smell of coffee that allows you for, you know, a kind of hopefully modest amount to be there or picking up your kids. These are things that that extend the welcome. And, um, you know, as I say, those part, you know, making, understanding our partners so they anticipate what will happen in these spaces and they've already they've already got a schedule of how they'll use the spaces is very exciting i think and breaks down all the paradigms we talked about great thank you for that um the next question is live streaming of performances here to stay if so uh, i think high quality digital equipment would be integrated into building finish out live streaming can greatly extend access and reach so I'll, I'll talk briefly about this because uh, a year ago, we also announced a partnership with Canon, the camera manufacturers. And, um, you know, we, for those of you that have been to the Jack Singer Concert Hall, which is a beautiful 1800 acoustic hall, um, um, that venue now has the ability to live stream, live broadcast. We have, a, we have you know, a 10 camera shoot um, with, with one person operating everything. It's all automated. And so it's incredibly fancy. Now, that to me is one thing. It's, it's, you know, and interestingly enough, digital technology has allowed us to break down the geographic barrier of cultural participation, which is a barrier that all of us in the live arts have historically sort of disregarded because, well, if you can't get to us, then we can't, we can't impact you. Um, so, so leaning into this relationship with digital technology has incredible Im implications for how we might build relationships with rural communities, certainly in Alberta and where we are. So, that's really interesting. The other conversation um, that we're having with Canon and, and the local artist community is how does this new technology not just allow for what might be perceived as archival uh, broadcasting? So it's not just about, you know, having you at home imagining or wishing that you would be in the Jack Singer concert hall. How does technology actually impact the way art's being created? Um, and Canon and, and many others have amazing technology. Um, uh, AMLOS is one that just got revealed uh, in January at CES, volumetric technology that Canon uses uh, with sports, where you can actually be at home and have a completely different cultural experience and not just feel like you were standing in the hall. So um, interestingly enough, um, you know, the, the earlier question I asked the panel, our, the, our relationship with digital technology has not accelerated during COVID as fast as I would have hoped for. Um, I think we are still just scratching the surface of what live arts and, and digital partners can do together. And I thought that by now, two years in, we would have been a lot more advanced, um, but, uh, but it's just about getting the right people at the table. And so Canon has certainly been a great partner to us. And as we move forward into the design and renovation of our, of our new and, and current building, that's certainly uh, something that we will take into consideration and integrate into certainly the spaces and rehearsal rooms. Um, we're even talking about having a, you know, a, a, a 360 degree uh, green screen room uh, so that whatever artists want to use uh, technology, they have a home for that at Arts Commons. That's amazing. Uh, this is a great question. I think a question very much of the now. Um, how can big institutions with buildings aid the thousands of amateur theater, dance, and choral groups on life support after COVID? I, I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to take a step. And then, so one of the things that I think is unique about, so Arts Commons is a performing arts center. We're not a theater company. We're not a dance company. We're not an orchestra, uh, which is not to say that running any of those companies is easy. It's not. But I think we need to embrace the role of a performing arts center, which is, it, to me, it's about stewarding an ecosystem and it's about prioritizing the local artist community. And, you know, I know we have resident companies uh, present here today. Our commitment is to resident companies and our commitment is to local artist communities and providing them with below market access to the highest quality venues, the highest quality production. Um, and we do that because we have as a performing arts center, we have different business verticals. 
So the business vertical of mine that requires me to support resident companies and community groups needs to operate at a deficit by design because that's our way of investing into community. Mm. It, means, it means that other business verticals need to unapologetically operate at a surplus. So food and beverage, rentals, you know, we will host weddings. Um, you know, I will unapologetically um, have conversations with commercial producers or commercial presenters and tell them that any surplus we have because they're bringing in an international name to Calgary, those surpluses allow us to then maintain this ecosystem. And so I think that A, that's hard enough to do, but B, I don't know that we've ever been transparent enough about what it entails to run a performing arts center because we need to be able to run the business. Uh, um, we need to have a healthy business if we're going to support the community. So the next time somebody says to me, oh, why, you know, why are you selling out to the man and hosting a bar mitzvah? I can say, well, we're doing it because we need to maintain this ecosystem and we need to find ways of generating revenue that aren't lining our pockets because we're still a nonprofit organization, but allow us to reinvest. Um, and so I think it's about performing arts centers, redefining their value proposition. Performing arts centers aren't just about bringing in big names to cities. It's about doing that. But in order to, in my opinion, um, elevate the local artist community and support organizations that need economies of scale, that need shared services that we have a responsibility to provide. So that's my two cents on the role that performing arts centers can play and that we do play in Calgary to allow smaller organizations to thrive, particularly during hard times. That sounds great. I mean, it seems to me it would be sim as simple as opening your doors in, in organizing. And it kind of ties back into the first question about using the space um, when you don't have your regular cultural performances. Um, I'd like to kind of tie in a couple of questions here, um, you know, given, um, I think this is a discussion of design as well, but, you know, um, post COVID, you know, we're, we're in this realm of sort of streaming like we are now and meeting digitally. But I remember in architectural history class, we studied the, uh, the Paris Opera House, right? And they talked about that sort of space outside, um, you know, Josh was talking about the sort of lobby, right? Where you are seen and you see and that fun time, like not just the performance, but prior to the intermission and then afterwards, how does, you know, the digital world sort of, make that happen you know that like right now there's only you know five of us see being seen and seeing you know i guess we're being seen but yeah do you, do you have any thoughts about that and this could be anybody uh, i'll i'll jump in on that we we, we have a, a sort of a, a sub company called agile lens which is doing a lot of work in in digital space and particularly um, developing new ways for people to uh, gather and interact in virtual space. And uh, yeah, they've done pilot projects, uh, for example, with the Actors Theatre of Louisville, where they did a, a, a version of Christmas Carol um, uh, with that you could join virtually, and the actors were virtual, and the actors were digitally um, uh, costumed. Um, and with different face rigs. So one actor played all the ghosts, for example. Um, and uh, in those, uh, as you construct those kinds of experiences for a, a virtual audience, you have to actually think about the space that they are sharing um, and whether you want them to appear together at all. One of the things that was done, I think, in, the, in that... Um, uh, Christmas Carol was that each audience member appeared as a little flickering flame so that you always had the sense of the presence of spirits or whatever, um, uh, who were, because it's virtual and it uses gaming technology, they were free to move around the actor also. So the actor was dimensionally captured with digital faces and things. Uh, the audience was free to move and you felt everyone's presence. Now that's a, a very sort of very specific example, but the technology is getting better and people are trying to figure out to um, how to deliver a, an, a, how to build community that is palpable 
um, uh, in the virtual space and how to mingle live audiences and virtual audiences and have them share an experience in a meaningful way, not just by looking at the videotape later on, but by uh, you know being able to sit virtually in a seat and look to the left and the right and see someone laughing next to you, because um, uh, that's part of the experience. So uh, people are working on that. There are all sorts of technical hurdles to overcome, um, and that will take a little while, but, but it's being fought about. Wonderful. All right, uh, we have just a few more questions. We're over time, but we'll just tough it out. Uh, how will new art centers address wayfinding, not just in terms of indoor outdoor signage, but how to encourage people in outlying areas to emotionally and spiritually find themselves, their families, their friends at the art center and to feel comfortable doing so? I think it, you kind of talked about this a little bit, Marion, by talking about like having a Cree word up, feeling welcome, but maybe you can talk about the uh, wayfinding design and that sort of thing. Well, I think I think buildings, choreographing a building, uh, I talk about choreography in a building, that, that there should be a kind of an intuitive feeling about how a building works that comes out of the architecture, the placement of stairs and vertical circulation elevators, um, making sure a building is accessible. Um, and I think it, you know, we, I don't think we'll have the challenges just because of the constraints of our, our site in some ways um, that, you know, the kind of transparency that you get from one end of the building to another actually might be quite clear because the boxes of the, 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 the theater boxes have to be positioned. But I, I think it, it is, there is wayfinding. And I think that, you know, what I mentioned and, uh, you know, related to a comment that Wanda had made, um, yeah, I don't really, I, choreography is the most important movement and flow and people knowing where to go and how to get to the washrooms and that the bars are positioned relative to the washroom. So you have that experience that is, you know, not, not, not making difficult experiencing experiences, but trying to facilitate the experience through the, through the placement of, of the building program around, around that, or within the architecture. I don't know if that really answers, but I, I think maybe my first answer was the better one. That's the best one. <laughs> Often is, right? Thank you very much. All right, I've been uh, asked to uh, wrap it up. So we are going to do so. Um, I would like to thank you once again. It's been amazing. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to interacting uh, with people in person and um, I wanted to just also let everybody know that we do have a program tomorrow at six on the one Vanderbilt building by the architect from KPF. Uh, with, with that, I will close the pro program. Thank you all very much for this has been very enlightening. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much.